every now and then, we talk to somebody from the de Department of Fish and Wildlife. Today it's Mark Marasini, and we are in his official man cave, <laughs> which is quite the man cave. Got all kinds of fun stuff. But the end product, the thing that we're going to be talking about today is the fact that Mark Marasini makes these beautiful flintlock rifles. Now, a lot of people don't realize this about Mark. I didn't until recently that he made these wonderful rifles. And as we're looking in front of us, there's various stages, various types. How do you even start? I started slow. I had an interest <laughs> in, in firearms. I started with uh, some of the kits uh, back in the late 70s. Uh, the, the kits back then made by Thompson Center were, they were good quality kits, but uh, they weren't nearly as finished as they are today. And it still took me a really long time to get one done. But it was one of those things where I just vowed I wouldn't use any power tools. and. I, I, the way I look at it is if you're content to remove one grain of sawdust at a time, you can build a rifle and not mess it up. In 10 years? <laughs> It'd take me 100. <laughs> It'd be a life's work for me. Okay, what are you working on right here? What is this in the vise right here? That's another uh, flintlock rifle. It's a 50 caliber. It, um, I'm using a, a Wayne Jenkins barrel. I'm putting that in a, in a maple stock, a curly maple stock. It has a Siler lock, Davis double set triggers, and uh, just whatever else I end up putting on it. It's, it's, it's of a, a Lancaster style. If you, mm -hmm. if you look at the schools of the old gunsmiths, it's Lancaster after Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Do you cut all these patterns into this wood here? Do you cut the pattern into the metal? Mm -hmm. I do it all. It takes, a lot of people can do these things a lot faster than I can, but I have about 300 hours in, in each of these rifles right here. It just takes me that long. A lot of people turn them out a lot faster they make a lot more of them than I do. Um, but again, you only work in, in the wintertime and you know during the times that you're not out chasing dogs or taking pictures or hunting and fishing and all that kind of stuff. Well, what are you, 30% done with this, 25% done? Where are you on this one? Maybe half. Maybe halfway? Now it's where I start putting the detailing in it mm -hmm. and turning it into something like this. I'll start finishing it, bringing it down, on down to where it gets you that delicate look to it. Uh -huh. And um, then now, I'll probably pick up a chisel and start carving. <laughs> now let me ask you this. This has an antique, a very antiqued look. Is it by accident? Is it by process that you use? How does this, how does it get to look that way? The wood, I use, a, I, I, I color the wood the same way they did the, the original old locksmiths did it. I use, it's aquafortis, it's, a, it's an acid. And I soak that acid into the wood and it'll dry and it'll have sort of a greenish yellow tint to it. And then I'll bring heat over top of it. And the gunsmiths, they would take a, a piece of hot poker in a fire until it was red hot. And they would just bring it over the wood real close to it without touching it. And the heat from that would turn that that real deep uh, brownish red color. Okay, how much of this is a work of art for you? How much is it a hunting tool, how much is it just uh, a history, something you enjoy history-wise? Well, it's all, of, it's all right? of those things, and it's probably whichever one of them I'm thinking of at the time. Um, clearly, I, I built this rifle as closely as I could to an original that I saw. Now, as I look around, I see all kinds of little chiseling tools. I suppose some of it's metalworking, some of it's, what are these laying right here? Those are, those are small chisels, and I use these probably more than I use anything else, and a file. For removing, removing little pieces of wood for whatever reason? Uh, just shaping the socks. This, is this the 45? That is, that's a 45. Now how do you know how to line this up and how do you know when everything's functioning properly? It fires. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing when it fires. <laughs> To, to make this thing function, you put a really fine black powder into that little pan right there. Mm -hmm. And you probably can't see, but there's a little, there's a little mm -hmm. hole, which is very precisely located, I think. And that, the location of that hole to that pan is, is critical to how fast the, lock, uh, to how fast the, 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 the rifle will fire. Mm -hmm. So when you put flash powder in there, which is a very fine black powder, and close the prison. Close that down. And then the flint hits the prison, 
forces it open, throws a shower of sparks down into the pan, ignites that powder, it flashes, and that flash co goes through the touch hole and ignites the powder charge inside the barrel, which explodes in the, the ball. Can we actually watch you do that? Sure. Just like that. Your, Just like your that. sparks fly off, hit the powder, goes in, ignites the charge, boom. Deer on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, do you shoot round balls? Mm -hmm. these? These, these, these have a slow twist in them, mm -hmm. which is about one full turn for 60 inches of barrel, and that's called a round ball twist. It will not stabilize a conical shaped bullet. You gotta remember that the flintlock rifles back during the Revolutionary War were considered the very most modern weapon of war. You know, and most people will look at that today and say, how could that ever be? But when British muskets were inaccurate after about 50 yards, and this rifle in the hands of a marksman could hit a pie plate at about 300 yards, that was a very, very critical advance. Today was kind of a personality profile on Mark Marasini, who works at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. What is an average I guess it changes from season to season, but what, what, what is an average week for you like? It's one of those things where you can go to work and just work as hard as you can all day long, come home and have somebody ask you what you did all day and you can't <laughs> even begin to tell them what it was. So many of the things we do there, you really don't see the results for so long, but clearly you can, you can look back uh, over time at the department and see exactly what's been done to realize that when, when I was born, that we had fewer than 3,000 deer in Kentucky. Amazing. I think these are the good old days for fish and wildlife yes. in Kentucky. But I had someone a, a week or so ago talking about they didn't see any deer this year. They just, they just didn't see any deer. And when you get to talking to them a little bit more, you find out they saw about 20 some deer. But they didn't see the big deer. Today in the office early this morning, um, Michael Monroe from Spencer County was in having her trophy deer uh, scored, and uh, 220 yeah. class buck, two, what, 219 and five eighths. When it's people not... come in now and they talk about they they didn't see any big ones and and they saw 140 class deer and 150 class deer and passed on. We have a lot of those now. We've come a long way, and. Uh, Man, I'm telling you what, you do some beautiful things here with these rifles. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Mark Marasini, Fish and Wildlife Employee Extraordinaire, thanks for taking us to your man cave.